This is Paul Eckberg from the Division of Infectious Diseases at Stanford University. In this video, we will discuss the non-beta-lactam cell wall active and cell membrane active antibiotics. The beta-lactams were discussed in two separate videos. Learning objectives include explain how the mechanism of action of the glycopeptides is different from that of the beta-lactams. Recognize that the glycopeptides and lipopeptides are usually administered to patients with confirmed or suspected MRSA infection. Explain why daptomycin cannot be used to treat pneumonia. And describe the current clinical role of the polymyxin class. In this overview of the non-beta-lactam cell wall and cell membrane active antibiotics, we will be focusing on three different classes of agents highlighted here in the yellow boxes. First, the glycopeptides and closely related lipoglycopeptides, denoted in this figure by their activity at the terminal D-alanine of the peptidoglycan layer, with vancomycin as the most common example. Like the beta-lactams, these antibiotics target peptidoglycan synthesis, but via a different mechanism of action. Second, the lipopeptides, which are active at the cytoplasmic membrane of the gram-positive bacteria, is represented by daptomycin. Third, the polymyxins, denoted here by lipopolysaccharide or LPS lipid A targeted antibiotics, are denoted by polymyxin B and colistin. Before reviewing these antibiotic classes, let's quickly review MRSA. This slide was also introduced in the beta lactams part one video. Recall that this type of Staphylococcus aureus is resistant to all beta lactams except for ceftaroline via a change in the target PBP called PBP2A. Treatment options are limited for this bacterium. However, MRSA is still reliably treated with two classes of intravenous antibiotics that we'll be discussing in this video, the glycopeptides and the lipopeptides, highlighted here in the red font in the last bullet. Let's start with vancomycin, the representative example of the glycopeptide class. Vancomycin is a narrow-spectrum agent versus gram-positive bacteria. It's slowly bactericidal relative to the beta-lactams and the lipopeptides, which are rapidly bactericidal. Vancomycin binds to D-alanine D-alanine of the peptidoglycan peptide to prevent cross-linking of the peptidoglycan chains. Resistance occurs when this target is modified. For example, it's changed to d ala d lactate in vancomycin-resistant enterococci. Another resistance mechanism is a thickened cell wall that may play a role in resistance in vancomycin non-susceptible Staphylococcus aureus. Please review the beta-lactam videos to remind yourself how this mechanism of action differs from that of the beta-lactams. However, you'll note that the end result is the same and that peptidoglycan synthesis is blocked. IV vancomycin is primarily used to treat bloodstream infections, endocarditis or heart valve infection, pneumonia, and other serious infections caused by MRSA. I need to stress here that this is MRSA infections. It's important to note that vancomycin should not be used if Staphylococcus aureus is isolated in culture and is proven to be methicillin sensitive, or MSSA, rather than MRSA. For MSSA, the anti-staphylococcal penicillins that we discussed in the beta-lactam videos are the drugs of choice. For example, nafcillin or dicloxacillin. Oral vancomycin is not absorbed systemically. This is used to treat Clostridium difficile associated disease. Adverse effects include the redneck syndrome, which is related to histamine release, leading to flushing of the head and neck, and rarely ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity, although these are most commonly seen when vancomycin is given with other nephrotoxic agents. Vancomycin is difficult to use in that you need to follow blood levels and frequently adjust the dose, especially if renal function is changing over time or worsening over the course of therapy. Newer glycopeptides include drugs like televancin, oritavancin, and dalbavancin. In your reading, you might see that these are referred to as lipoglycopeptides and grouped under a separate antibiotic class from the glycopeptides. However, for the purposes of this video overview, I group them together with vancomycin as, quote, newer glycopeptides. They're semi-synthetic agents derived from vancomycin, 
and like vancomycin, they bind to the peptidoglycan d -ala d -ala to prevent cross-linking of the peptidoglycan chains. They also disrupt cell membrane potential and increase cellular permeability. These agents are approved for skin and soft tissue infections, but have not displaced vancomycin use in clinical practice. Adverse effects include nephrotoxicity and potential teratogenicity with regard to televancin. And it's really unclear how these newer agents will be best utilized. Unlike most other antibiotics, aritavancin and dalbavancin have very long half-lives and can actually be given IV once weekly, which is an interesting property. Shifting gears to the lipopeptide antibiotic class, there's only one representative member currently available in the U.S., daptomycin. Daptomycin has a similar spectrum of activity to the glycopeptides. However, it is more rapidly bactericidal than vancomycin. The mechanism of action is seen in the picture here showing how daptomycin binds to the cytoplasmic membrane in step one and forms a possible pore-like complex in step two in a calcium-dependent manner. This eventually leads to loss of intracellular potassium and cell death, shown here in step three. Daptomycin is usually reserved for serious MRSA infections. It's FDA approved for skin and soft tissue infections, bacteremia, and right-sided endocarditis. Daptomycin is relatively well tolerated. However, you should be aware of the unique adverse effect of myopathy, or muscle damage, which requires monitoring of serum CPK levels to allow the treating physician to stop drug if they rise during therapy. Finally, daptomycin is inactivated by alveolar surfactant. This is extremely important because staphylococci, including MRSA, are potential causes of pneumonia, and this antibiotic should never be used in patients with pneumonia suspected to be caused by or proven to be caused by any staphylococcal species. Finally, let's briefly discuss the polymyxins. In contrast to the glycopeptides and lipopeptides, which are narrow-spectrum antibiotics with activity against gram-positive cocci, the polymyxins are narrow-spectrum agents with activity against gram-negative pathogens. Polymyxins are cyclic peptides that target LPS. Their hydrophobic tail is involved in the disruption of membrane phospholipids, as seen in the accompanying picture. The polymyxins were abandoned in the 1970s due to toxicity, including nephrotoxicity, which is quite common, and neurotoxicity. However, there's been renewed interest in the use of these agents, given extremely limited treatment options for multidrug-resistant gram-negative pathogens. One example is carbapenem-resistant enterobacteriaceae, or CRE, which we mentioned in the beta-lactam videos. CRE is often multidrug resistant, in addition to being carbapenem resistant, and treatment options are extremely limited. Finally, I list some examples of the polymyxin formulations at the bottom of the slide. This includes an inhaled formulation for use with cystic fibrosis-related pulmonary exacerbations due to Pseudomonas or Burkholderia species, an IV formulation, and a topical preparation with polymyxin B.